Now time to talk about the open order revolution and thank you for patrons who voted on this topic. Now I put out the vote before I read the article and then I realized uh -huh, I don't really like that article because it was it was quite interesting and I got the general point but it was generally too vague and I didn't really got my real hang on it so I was like okay I could do a video with it but and I'm not too certain, so I, I, I did more and more and more reading. So basically, and then I got down, okay, because the main issue is open order and closed order are usually mentioned by several authors and everywhere, but in general, there seems to be no real... It's more like they all mention it that you know what it is. And I was like, yeah, I have kind of the idea what it is, but I really want to get down to this. So first off, I try to drill down what are the core factors between open order versus closed order. So basically, what you think about when you think about open order is skirmish lines. So you have your troops spread out and versus closed order, you have the columns, you have the lines. Each man is close to each other, as you know, for instance, for the Napoleonic Wars, where you see them. And skirmishes, they spread out. So, for open order, you have basically the use of terrain, whereas for closed order, you have the use of mass. Similarly, if you look at fire, skirmishes are usually for precision firing, whereas for closed order, you have the volume of fire. You use volley fire, it's about putting as much shot out as possible, the accuracy is limited, it's just about mostly the volume you get out. Well, skirmishes sometimes or quite early were equipped with rifles because they have to do the rifling a better accuracy and everything. For closed order, it was more important to have a high rate of fire. So they usually used smooth ball for quite some time. This also means for open order, it's more focused on fire tactics, whereas for closed border, it's more on shock tactics. Then also open order, more on closer units, on so open order also more smaller units, whereas for closed order more larger units because you need the shock, you need the amount of fire and everything. Additionally, then if you look at open order again, it's more about initiative. It's more about taking the right position, the individual. These units were usually more loyal as well. Whereas for closed order, it's about, it's about control that your NCO and your officer really sees where you are and gives very strict and close uh, and, and focused orders and everything is in line and strong. So this also brings then for open orders mostly about flexibility. You go with the flow more or less, use the terrain. Whereas for, for the closed order, it's about cohesion that the cohesion of the unit is still fulfilled, that nobody breaks away. And this also brings for the open order, you have the individual versus the cog in the machine in the closed order. Now, if you look at this, this brings several important requirements to open order. One is loyalty. Open order units, skirmishers, jägers and something, they were usually the loyal ones that were not kept, had to kept on a leash like the other units, the line units. So they, they could be trusted more or less or way more than the other ones. So still you know, there's a dust there, but, and this is something in modern com in early modern combat that yeah, a lot of time desertion was a main issue. So you had them less in these units because they were generally more loyal. Then to a certain degree, it was some kind of education. So quite often they were sometimes for Frederick the Great to use them like these were the, the foresters guys. Yeah, they know the terrain well and everything. And then they also needed different equipment, usually some proper guns, usually rifles, because they were more accurate. And then the leadership was also more important, usually more aspect was given or more leeway to what you say nowadays would be an NCO. So you have more on the not officer controlling, but on, on the mid level. And also you have basically more focus on training and less focus on drill. Now, back to the original point, what was the open water revolution? Now, the authors describe it basically as the major transformation of tactics that happened between 1854, so the Crimean War, to 1914. 
So why was this necessity to go more open order than previously? Well, it comes down to an improvement in technology. Basically, the rifle replaced the smooth bore musket. What does this mean? You have more precision, but still you have a higher rate of fire. Because previously you, got, you, got, you went with the smooth bore musket because you had a higher rate of fire. But you, you had a lack of precision. And rifles were thus previously before given to specialists, but now the rifle is sufficient enough or well-developed enough that you can give it to regular units. And two very important rifles here, the Mini rifle, which was basically a rapid muzzle loader from the French, around, introduced about 1849. So this allowed to load from the muzzle still, but rapidly. So we had a higher rate of fire. And from the Prussians, there was the Dreiser needle gun, the Stundnadelgewehr, which was a breech loader in 1841. So you could load from the breech, which meant you could reload prone. Very important, so way more cover. In general, the results were higher rate of fire and higher accuracy. Other developments that happened in the timeline were standardized ammo and Round balls converted to point bullets, so also better ballistics and everything. Yet there were even more developments, especially in the 1880s. Now you had smokeless powder, which meant that you could actually more or less hide as infantry, because before you were just sitting in a big plume of smoke after you fired your first shot. Then the stripper clip was basically introduced, so you had several, like five cartridges in in one rifle and not just have to reload for every shot, which of course incre increased the rate of fire even more and then you had smaller caliber, which meant you could carry more ammo and you had also less recoil, which of course introduced, uh, increased your firepower again. Now this is very important here, so you had a substantial increase in firepower in this time. And this to a certain degree for some authors note this explains why the machine gun was also put at lesser importance. Because you had just a major increase in firepower so that you don't need more firepower. So it's like, okay, we have already way more firepower than we had ever before. I don't think we need more. And of course, there were other issues. Some actually were thinking, okay, um, fire discipline is an issue and we don't know if the ammo is enough. So, and if you're there and you think, okay, we, I don't think we have enough ammo, then here I have a machine gun. It's, it, it, it wastes even more ammo in less amount of time. It's like, uh, no, I don't want to have something that even shoots way more ammo away because I'm already scared that my, my units don't hold fire discipline and they will run out of ammo before, before they, they get in proper effective firing range or something or before the battle is over. And of course, another aspect was that, for instance, the Prussians and Germans were very focused on the attack and the early machine guns were not properly suited for the attack. So this was also a doctrine issue. So it, they, they, they looked at it and said, yeah, that's a great weapon for defending, but we are, we are Prussians, we like to attack anyway. So, so there's also an, another aspect why the machine gun, it was not ignored or something, or they were not all ignoring, it was just, in some cases, it didn't fit in there well. Now, another issue that came up due to these improved rifles was you were now less exposed if you were in the defense because you, you could lie down, you could reload your weapon while prone, which was previously not possible. So this, was, of course, would hinder the attack, which re requires a change in tactics. And then you now just say, okay, let's go from closed order to open order. And actually, in the 19th century, there was constantly a back and forth between the two. And one issue was the challenge of command. Because in close order, you had a very strong grip on your man. And they were all drilled on this. So you basically drilled your man to perform like automatons to a certain degree. Now, there was the issue that you need different training for this man now. You need more focus on training and less on drill. You need more focus on in initiative and, and other aspects. You need also more loyalty because you, you, you can't keep them on the leash that much in open order. 
And so you had the issue of control versus obedience and everything. And the actuary noted that in some cases, fine soldiers, the perfectly drilled soldiers, when they put into open water, that they didn't perform anymore, that they didn't advance. Because they were just not used to this thing. They were not used to be, initi to be initiative and, and as individuals or more or less individuals and go forward. So then there was a whole necessity to change training. And this also led to organizational challenges as well. So the units got smaller. So before the, the core unit, you focused on a battle. The battlefield was 400 to 600 guys with muskets. And now you look more on 50 to 100 men with rifles. So you got more independent subunits. This meant you put people in permanent commands that were previously not there. And smaller units are harder to control, especially in the attack as well. And other issues were, of course, the general discussion. For instance, the Germans always say, effect for deco, effect before cover. So Effect is more important than cover, which meant you massed a lot of firepower on a small frontage. Do you want to have a maximum of firepower on a small frontage? But then you have the problem that you're way more exposed, especially against artillery. So what are you going to do? You want to minimize your losses or you want to maximize your firepower on a certain area? So. One is clearly, okay, let's stay close to order because, I mean, we're trained everyone for this already and the other as well. Something that similarly happened in the whole area here in the development, which is kind of related, is the change in colors from, from more or less bright and colorful uniforms to more, yeah, more, more camouflage looking areas. Because now you had smokeless powder, so it actually made sense to hide to a certain degree and you were firing prone. So... Hiding or getting cover actually made sense now, while before it was off. The, the benefits were limited to a certain degree. Now a few examples here to get a basic understanding on how the, the back and forth looked. So we have the Battle of Königsgrätz in 1866, the Prussians against Austria. So the Prussians attack in, in open water, when the Austrians attack with closed order charges. The Austrians take heavy losses and are quite shocked because the Prussians with the Dreise needle gun have a high rate of fire and sometimes they just shoot together the, the Austrian columns. So quite often it's just attributed to the, to the needle gun and everyone, okay, it was just better technology, but it's not that easy. And also the victory was not so easily achieved. Now here was the problem, actually the Prussians had quite some problems controlling these loose formations, the open order formations. It was not so well. And the main issue was that Austrian, the Austrians were very weak in skirmishing and also in marksmanship. If they had been well better trained, this could have led to a quite a different outcome or, or it would have not been as decisive. And it basically at this point, the, the Prussians had an edge in tactics and also technology. Usually you have at, le have at most one. So there was this, it was quite an imbalanced fight to a large degree. And they were aware of this. So they were like, okay, we need to do something because other people are watching, for instance, the French. And so in 1870, when they were fighting against the French, the French basically used Prussian tactics from, from Königsgrätz. And the Prussians charged in closed order, although they should have known better, and they took quite a lot of losses. And what they did, they adapted quite rapidly, they went to in a more open order, and they used the artillery to shoot together the, the, the French. So they have better artillery now, because there they actually saw that the, the Austrians had quite some value they developed and improved their artillery. Now to give you some specific numbers here, we have some data for the first world war on the Eastern Front in September 1914. And there was one company that attacked in close quarter and the other companies in open war. The company in close quarter had losses of 50%, up to 50%, whereas the companies in open war about 1.67%. So there was a huge discrepancy here. 
I didn't find any other examples for this, so maybe this is an extreme example. But even if it's if it would be half the values for the for the loss in the closed order, and they also know that there were other brigades as well, other units that had similar issues. So in general, if at this point closed order was led to very high losses. I hope this gives you a basic understanding on the whole issue of closed versus open border and what the open order revolution meant. So, big thank you here to Jack for sending me the book on infantry. And thank you for watching. See you next time. Bye.